Today we're here with a former Australian diver, a good friend of mine that I've trained with and now have done a bit of work with for close to a decade now. Now, Hamish has represented Australia at many world events and it's a pleasure to have you on today, bro. Thanks for having me, dude. Um, I didn't think I'd get to jump on here with you, but hey, this is it's going to be a fun fun time. Just to give people some context, like yeah. Hamish and I have done so much of my content together as well. Mm. Like you've filmed a lot of my diving videos that have generated over a billion views. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess they started back when we used to do those triple S's. We did. Yeah. What was that? The Secret Sydney Spots. Secret Sydney Spots, <laughs> yeah. And uh, from there, just having fun along the way and helping you out. Obviously, you've shot up and grown massively, which is awesome. And I've just been there for, for the ride. It's been fun. It's, it's been good. It's crazy because some of the first content I ever made, and it's mm. still on YouTube, yeah. we made together. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's uh, yeah, it's good to look back at every now and then. You know? It's also crazy to think that because you video a lot of my stuff, but you've never had any professional videography training, like, what, how do you think you'd learn to be able to video so well and, and become really, really helpful in that aspect? Yeah, well, my dad, he was a photographer, a wedding photographer. And growing up, he just taught me a lot of like the tricks of like the camera and how to like angle properly and adjust. And so I think when you started like doing stuff and wanting my help, I was like, yeah, yeah I'll happily help. And it just ended up being half decent and then eventually pretty good. And then now it's good enough to consistently film stuff for you. So, yeah, I, I enjoy doing it, and it's more like just just for fun, to help out a mate. I love doing it there. A huge credit to, to Hamo. When I get to do something like film or mm. not even a small task, but an important one, like you put in the effort, you put in the concentration, and I feel like that's something you take everywhere in your career. Where, where do you learn to take note of those small details? Yeah, thanks, dude. Um wouldn't be sure exactly where I learned to get in in touch with those small details. I I think I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, helped with diving, you know. It does, eh? Yeah. Being... It can be detrimental, eh? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, but yeah, perfectionist, definitely through sport. And then that just translated over into everything else I did. Wanted to be 100% accurate on as much stuff as I could. So, yeah. Because you started with gymnastics when you were young, right? Tell me about that journey. Yeah, so I started doing gym when I was about four. Um, and then from four, I moved on to a to the New South Wales High Performance Squad um, when I was seven. And from seven to 14, I trained with them, training nine times a week, like similar to diving, but just with gymnastics. And then went to a couple nationals in gymnastics. And then from there... Decided to give it up, but I didn't want to just go to like soccer, which I love, but I didn't want to just go to a sport that wasn't similar. So mum and dad suggested diving. And from there, just fit in quickly, obviously met all the boys. That's how, yeah, that's yeah. actually how we met. Yeah, it, it was pretty good. Like I came in, um, I tried diving once before, back when I was in year six. Um, was pretty good, but not training as much as when I was a bit older. And then Vaninka, actually, our coach, yeah. when we were in Ensfys out. She was great. Awesome coach. She, she whipped us in the shape. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. mentally as well. Like. Yeah. Per- perfect coach. If it wasn't for her, I don't think I would have stuck with diving in the first place. Um, but, yeah, so she saw me and one or two of the other boys who were doing gymnastics at the time and suggested that we come and train once a morning back when I was, like, 11 or 10 and did that for a year. And then she was like, when you're ready to come back to diving, because um, I decided to continue doing gym, when you're ready to come back to diving, <laughs> give me a call and um, we'll see what we can do. So finished up gym when I was 14 and then gave her a call and she's like, yep, um, let's see what we can do. And then pretty quickly got into the institute and just went from there. I love divers come from gymnastics or or trampoline because those skills transfer over so easy easily like mm. saying you wouldn't go to soccer because you've built up those mental patterns of how to flip how to twist that can trade into it when you came to diving at 14 yeah how'd you find that transition from full-time gym elite athlete to full-time diving it's a big difference 
Yeah, it was really interesting. The first thing I noticed was my height. I actually grew like three centimeters <laughs> in like the two weeks I transitioned, um, which which was good. I was a very short kid, so I was happy to grow. Um, but in terms of the skills of the sport, I was surprised in a good and a bad way. Like I was surprised how easily a lot of the movements were exactly the same, the flipping and the twisting, but it was the direction you take off, like how yeah. how much like how stood up you have to be, you know, like you can't be leaning forward or otherwise you're halfway out the pool. Um, those parts were hard and hard to get rid of the gymnastics habits, but the actual flips and twist part were quite easy. Diving's so challenging like that because the angle of takeoff basically determines the whole dive. Mm. Uh, and because it goes so fast, that angle can go right or wrong. And just by repetitions, you can try to train it to be in a good range. Exactly. Yeah. And that was definitely, I think for most gymnasts, I think you could agree with this because you came from a gymnastics background as well. Um, just getting that angle takes a bit of time. <laughs> and I found neatness. Like as a gymnast, mm. I feel like I could send stuff. Yes. It didn't look good. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's a big send because gymnastics was, at least I found it to be a lot more chuck and go. Probably not the best <laughs> term, but... Uh, Just send it and hope for the best. Yeah, you know, a bit a bit more carefree. Whereas, as you said, diving is a very neat, very polished, refined sport. And that's what I liked with the perfectionism as well. That was good. We actually dove synchro together. Yeah. In fact, over in, over in Ukraine. Yeah, a couple times. Um in Ukraine, uh, PSG, yeah, we became nationals. the PSG champions. That was a fun comp. That was such a, <laughs> a funny story. We were, mm. how, how did they even work out? Because yeah. there's a bit of uh, heat around us diving together out there. Yeah, so as far as I believe, you used to do synchro with one of the other boys in our squad. Yeah, and on that, three meter, on three meter. Um, but that nationals, school nationals. We were both doing 10 meter and we had similar dives and had a list and we're like, let's do synchro. And they had u- they had unique rules where three meter and 10 meter were in the same event. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it was a pretty cool competition. And so you and I went together and then another two boys who were uh, fierce competitors, they went They together. were fierce competitors. They like, were. <laughs> they really were. They were training in secret. We knew these divers were good as well. Like yeah. we knew that they were good. Yeah. We were under the pump. Yeah. And they were pulling strings too. Like. 100%. And and our advantage was our degree of difficulty. Yeah. Just sending <laughs> our big our big new dives. And the other boys were competing some pretty hard dives, but off three meter. There was also a bit, a bit of talking smack. Oh, what, what's, a, what's a friendly diving competition without smack, you know? A bit, a bit of a friendly banter. It's yeah. always good. Um, but yeah, we ended up just scraping by, beating them. Yeah. And uh, they weren't happy about it, but sure, we we, we were so happy. <laughs> it's funny how those wins, even if it's just by a margin, the ones you really had to fight for mm. just feel the best. Yeah. Oh, it was, yeah, it was a good feeling. Great feeling. Right. Mm. And they were pulling all the strings, and then we just, we, we came through, took the win, and then we head over to Ukraine for the Junior World Championships at the time. I, I remember mm. flying in. You knew he didn't get into the country. Yeah, that's right. On my um my visa, yeah. I forgot to put a photo. <laughs> they took so immigration there was really yeah. serious. Like they triple checked everything. Yeah, and we just gotten <laughs> off the plane, and you whipped out your visa, and your photo was missing. Yeah, there was a a photoless visa, and so it was a bit of a yeah. I had had to convince them that I was there. Not illegally. So, <laughs> <laughs> what happened when you got to customs? Because I remember we were all making jokes. You should draw a stick figure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. They weren't happy. They they had quite stern faces, as most airport security do. Yeah. And I pretty much, I think the saving grace was the fact that we were all wearing our Australian tracksuits yep. and we we're there as a team. And so, Vaninka, the coach, and Did she other have team to come members. Over to the beat? Um. Yeah, and my mum and my family also came to watch as well, but they were on a later flight, so they, they weren't there to help. So um, we ended up getting through that, which was good. Took a bit of convincing, but we got through. We needed you there for the events. Exactly, exactly. We've been diving the <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was a, an interesting start to a good trip. So. I think that was one of my first major like international events. Yeah, same here. Yeah, been to. I think I'd been to Germany beforehand. Yeah. Um, but Ukraine was the first big one. I remember the one of the days at training there too. So we, we were training. <laughs> <laughs> we 
yeah. we were in Ukraine training for the, the synchro event and I was warming up. We did a few entries on five and then we went up to 10 with it to do one of our easier dives. Mm. And I hit the water and just like pulled the muscle in my neck. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it's like just the beginning of the session. And it was like a really sharp pain. It was so uncomfortable, but mm. I had it before. So I knew it would only take a few days to go away. Yeah. And I go on physio. <laughs> and then I see you come in like 10 yeah. minutes later. Yeah. So what happened was after you got sent off, I was told to do my individual list. I'm like, yeah. all right, sweet. Train my individual list. Should be about half an hour, 40 minutes, and it should be done. The next dive up, <laughs> the <laughs> stairs were very steep, um, and they were like concrete sharp blocks. They were really sharp. They were sharp, steps. yeah. And I tripped on the stairs, landed on my knee, and I split my knee open. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, oh no, shit, like, this is not good. <laughs> like, What should I do? Just kept walking up to 10, just started bleeding, bleeding. A bit more, I'm like, ah. Oh. Dude, this is really bleeding. So I ended up doing one dive off 10 meter. Probably should have walked back down, but no, nah, I didn't Didn't want to do the walk of shame. So <laughs> the walk of shame, you avoided at all costs. Exactly. And then um, got down to pool deck, went over to our coach and was like, yeah, I've hurt myself as well. <laughs> <laughs> and she was not happy. And then, <laughs> and then um, went to the medical room where the physio was and you were like, are you done already? But I'm like, no, nah, I just hurt myself as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that that's how our synchro started off at that comp. Yeah. I'll tell you what, having a physio travel with you mm. is so important and you don't realize how much you need it until you need it. And 100%. Because once you do have a small injury at a major event, you've got to like manage it and get it into a position where it's okay to train and compete to at least get through the week. 100%, yeah. I mean, there was definitely some times where I've had some work done during competition <laughs> that's been detrimental. Um, but that's all like a learning experience. You need so, a good physio. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like yeah. good physios obviously are very important. Yeah. Um, but knowing. Is that when your calf got new? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My calf. So we're in, we're in Gold Coast and, um, I had like a small strain in my calf and I asked the physio who was there at the time. Wait, can I say, yeah. I'm only laughing <laughs> because, because oh, I'm only laughing because, sorry, this is such good memories. Yeah. <laughs> not, not your calf. Me, <laughs> me and Hamish were rooming together at the time. We'd That's already right. been traveling for a, a few weeks competing in Adelaide and yeah. this was the Commonwealth Games trials and we we're both <laughs> chipping away, doing everything we could. <laughs> And I was fighting niggles as well. And then when you had your, your calf... It was just a small calf niggle. <laughs> and so I was like, we had the availability for physios yep. and masseuses to go through it. We, I'm like, okay, I might as well. You know, important competition. Want to be in tip-top shape. Ended up getting some dry needling done in my calf. I'd never had dry needling done in my calf before. And it seized up and locked my calf. And so <laughs> for the next two days, I had like... A seized up calf muscle. I wasn't able to bend my leg. I wasn't able to point my toes. And <laughs> I remember walking back into the room afterwards where you were. And um, yeah, it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> it was not I remember because I was just like, hey man, like, how, how was physio? <laughs> man, it's gotten worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. No, good, good, good memories like that. So yeah, they're, they're definitely a blessing. Um, but it's, Probably not worth trying something new, which is what I did at that cop. <laughs> Getting dry needling done. It's like one of the one of like the the secret sources mm. around comp. You don't do anything massively different. Yeah. You don't try anything new, and yeah. it's interesting because I suppose when you have the physios and you have the support network, you still need to try to make the best decisions to look after yourself as well. Like, yeah, definitely. And, and and try to try to get the, get through it. <laughs> yeah. so when it's out of your control it's like what do you do because you I don't know when physio is working on you it's hard to say like I don't think that's going to help because they're the expert 100% you know you you question your own judgment and theirs and it's a bit of a predicament so you just kind of like let it be and it's either good and sometimes it's bad but most of the time it's good from your diving career because mm. you were a platform diver yeah what some of the personal highlights that you've had what part of it did you did you enjoy the most from platform yeah yeah from I, comps your successes definitely so as you said i was a platform diver and then 
eventually had to go down to three meter um, because of some injuries. But I definitely wish I was still able to compete platform. Really? Yeah. Do you miss it? Well, at least whilst I was still diving. Okay. Once I had to move to springboard, I didn't miss platform. Yeah. I just, the thrill of it, you know, the height, the fear, the speed, it was all fun. It was, uh, I wasn't very good at springboard in the first place anyway. I thought your springboard was pretty solid, especially in juniors. Your first list was always pretty good. Yeah, it was good enough, but I just felt more at home on platform. Do you find, because I compete a lot of springboard now as well. Mm. I still do 10 meter. And when I hit the dive on 10 meter, I feel this sense of like like nerves, but like also a bit of pressure, a bit of fear. Yeah. Then when you hit it, it's like this feeling of like success. It's like, yeah, like that. You get a lot of satisfaction from it. 100%. I think that's probably one of the things I miss the most, the adrenaline that you get from sending a massive dive yeah. or at least the hardest dive you have at that time. You know, that that's something I miss. It's scary as hell, obviously, but I just, once you, as you said, once you get it or once you push yourself off and you land in the water relatively safely, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's satisfying. And it's more satisfying, I found, than repeatedly doing that on springboard, you know? And that that's what I miss. But I also... I think you asked um, what my favorite experiences are yeah. from platform. Yeah. So competing in Dresden, and and which is in Germany, and Ukraine as well at the Junior Worlds, those two were definitely some of my more fun experiences. Um, obviously, traveling overseas is very fun. In terms of a competition, I remember there was a state comp you and I did oh, where we, that's right. we just went dive for dive for dive for dive. You ended up coming out on top, hats off to you, but that was a good comp, and I, I miss being able to be super competitive, doing my best, and putting up a fight. Like, yeah, It's a good feeling when you're competing against your mate, mm. and you're both doing well, because a saying that I like in diving is, you don't want them to make a mistake, you just want to dive better. Exactly. Like, yeah. You just want to dive better, and... When it comes to those competitions and you go and dive for dive, there's like no better feeling. Hundred percent, and that's it. Like if you can, if you if you can um, do your best, right, your physical best, and it's still not good enough. You can't be upset with that, right? It's like you've done everything in your own preparation up until that moment to get here, and if it didn't pan out for the result you wanted, it just means you got to go back. Try a bit harder, do something different, and that's what I loved about it. I guess the only thing with diving is it's not always perfect, you know. Yeah. It's a hit and miss. Um, it is like you can do the work, you can hit the dive in training two minutes before, and then go on a comp and make a mistake. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think one other really nice experience I had was uh, beating you at Pacific oh, School no. Games. The, the <laughs> infamous Pacific School Games. Yeah. Hamish, so, <laughs> Hamish and I were really competitive for. Yeah. A long time. That state comp being one of them, because we both mm. got personal best on the day. Yeah, that's right. Fairly soon after, we had this competition called the Pacific School Games, mm. which was an international event Yeah, over in Adelaide. Yeah. And me and Hamish were really tight at the moment. And this was the competition before the Commonwealth Games trials. Yeah, that's right. So stakes were high. Yeah, stakes were high. And what was your mindset going into that comp? Because that's the first time... The, you beat me and you became specific school games yeah, champion. Yeah, definitely. F first time I'd beaten you like in a decent competition. Um, not just like we'll do a round it in training or something. So yeah, like it was, I just went in there super confident. I find that obviously like a lot of sports and athletes talk about getting in the zone and the zone is exactly what I got in. I was like, no distraction. I knew exactly what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. I didn't mind if I came second, but it was more just, I want to execute these dives exactly this way. And that's how it happened. Like, I missed, I think, one one of my dives, but then so did you. I think our back three and a halves yeah. weren't that great. Um, but in the end, I just kind of like after the last round, I saw the score. I'm like, oh, I actually won. Um, and it was a great feeling. It was very fulfilling because like, obviously I was always just a little bit behind you in points, but to get there, it was nice, you know? So uh, that, that was a good memory. And then to, I think the next day or 
two days later, go and do synchro. Yeah. Yeah. And then win there with you. That was fun. That's it. I think that was one thing I miss about diving was the competitiveness I had with some of my best mates, Mm. you know, because it was like best mates outside the pool, even in the pool. But then when it came to competition, you had to set them as your rival. Mm. Otherwise, you don't want to be on the back foot because they're your friend. That's something I love about diving and I Mm. suppose our friend group as well, that Mm. you're not competing when you're having dinner. Like, exactly. You're not competing <laughs> yeah. when you're hanging out. Yeah. Only at the competition. Yeah. So all that stays at the competition. And then when you're away from the pool, mm. you're just best mates. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a great sport and I'm grateful for the the many friends I've made through it. So How'd you find diving in Gold Coast? Because that's always been quite challenging with the sky and the water blowing. I've done a lot of comps there. Mm. I've yeah. seen a lot of people get injured there. Yeah. How'd I you actually, find it? Yeah, I actually always loved Gold Coast because I knew that the first time I competed there, I think everyone else competing had done the year previous competition, but I'd only just kind of like started the sport a year earlier, um, a year or two earlier. And so I was in the mindset that everyone already has a little bit of fear built up with this place. I want to use that to my advantage. Mm. So I went there with the mindset of, I love this place. I love the wind. I don't care if it's blowing a hundred kilometers an hour. I I'm going to soak it up. It's going to help me spin faster. Just coming up with dumb excuses as to why. But this is your internal dialogue. This is my internal dialogue, and I ended up enjoying the place. And I remember a lot of the other people were not happy or did not like it because it's quite easy to get injured there. And like well, at least previous people have shown, it's quite easy to get injured there. And so, yeah, I was just very very positive thought minded like very positive thinking going into that place and it ended up being pretty good so yeah that's an that's another trait i've always noticed about you when you were competing you'd always try to look at things positive keep that positive talk be very optimistic and Mm. try to visualize and achieve that that goal and i I could see you doing those things like if i i asked you what do you think of the four you're like no it's good Mm. i love this yeah. Where'd you learn to train your brain and, and to keep chipping away? Yeah, great question. I think a lot of it comes from my father. Like he's a very positive thinking, great role model for me and my brother and my two sisters. And he's always instilled in us that like, if you like start thinking negative about something, it's generally not going to turn out how you want it to, right? That's pretty common thing and so however in sport it's very easily to get scared it's very easily to kind of distract yourself with wrong information so he kind of like taught me throughout my gymnastics career and along with my coaches and other mentors how to keep positively focused even in times that are really bad and scary and once I came to diving I think that was one of the reasons I progressed as quickly as I did was because even if I was shit scared of something, I would just positive thoughts, make sure I knew in my head what was happening, like good visualization, positive thoughts. And I had those, I think, at a younger age than a lot of other kids. And I think that's what helped me get up to a decent level pretty quickly. Those traits too, of like visualization and staying positive are just so applicable across the board for everything. Mm. Like those two things have helped me achieve so many other goals in my life outside diving. Like that's something I've really taken away from the sport. Like yeah. those success strategies, maybe not how to do a backflip, <laughs> the, the mental strategies you use in the pool are applicable everywhere. Have you found that helpful in other areas of your life? hundred percent. And I actually want to give credit to you here. Like your mental fortitude and how headstrong you are was def it. Yeah. It's definitely influenced my positive attitude to a lot of things especially in diving and now that I don't dive anymore outside of diving you know so um it's it's not just from my parents or from myself it's from my close friends and as you were saying like we've got a really nice group of friends and all of us are pretty similar in that state and take things off each other which is beneficial and that's one thing I definitely admire and take off you it's good Cheers, brother. Yeah. I found it really helpful in diving that you got Two people, and this is competitiveness, mm. like trying to be the best that they can using physical, mental, 
and like any other advice they can get to be on their edge and yeah. you compete against each other and then you just kind of sharpen up each other. Like you continue to grow. 100%. Like when you're constantly with people doing similar things and trying to get ahead, like it forces you to move forward. Yeah. So the more I grow, the more you grow and, and vice versa. Yeah. That That is a great dynamic as well because it's not like two people competing and trying to cheat each other or pull each other away. It's the complete opposite of building, where you build each other. Yeah, as you said. It's, it's cool. like good for everyone. Yeah. Because yeah. you learn your full 10 meter list. Just to give people perspective, it normally mm. takes around, oh, it takes a long time to learn a 10 meter list. The yeah. 10 meter list, once you have it, you can compete all over the world yeah. with that list. It takes a long time to build and it's very dangerous. Yeah. Especially learning. You learned yours in about a couple six months. months yeah, period? six months. So, it was a very quick six months, um, very exciting six months as well. But I just moved into a different squad. So I moved from coach Vaninka to Howell, who's your coach as well now. Yeah. And within the, that first six months, I, you know, I came up with a plan just to like fast track um, the 10 meter progression and learnt this one dive and then a month later another dive and then... Sometimes learning two dives in like within the space of a week or two. And yeah, got them up. Weren't the prettiest, but that's not training. They never are the star. Yeah. Right? Um, and the last two I learned were right before we went to junior nationals. I learned them, I think, the session before we left. Which dives were they? Were they uh, a back one and a half, three and a half twist? Yes. So back three and a half twist. That was a cool one. And. Inward three and a half as well. Yep. Um, That's my favorite dive. Yeah. Yeah. Dive. You're really good at that dive. But um, yeah, back three and a half twist I love because no one at the time in the country was doing it. I was the only one who was competing it. So it was really fun. Felt like I had my edge on the competition a little bit and I was pretty good at twisting. So that was, I learned that and was confident to compete it the next week at the competition without training it. You were always quite good at twisters. Yes, yeah. It's oh, not the first time. You've actually learned you twister before a comp. Back to and half twist? Yeah. Lightning Ridge? <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. I, I also remember... This one, is not uncharted territory for him. No, yeah. I learned back to and half twist at a comp once. Um, I think there was another dive I learned at a comp. Back dive, pike off 10. Probably at Lightning Ridge as well. Yeah, probably. So coming into juniors, you mm. learned these two new dives. Yep. Was this the world championship trial? No, this was the year before. This was in Perth, Tasmania, Perth. Okay, Perth, because Tasmania was freezing cold. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, freezing cold. But also that was the selection trials. That's when you had the nosebleed. Oh my god, I went like blind. And <laughs> had a nosebleed, and we'll get to when you went blind. In yeah, the water. <laughs> that was scary. Um, but yeah, so Perth Nationals. When I just learnt these two new dives, I had super nervous all week. One of them I was pretty comfortable with, the twisting one. The inward three and a half I was not very comfortable with. Um, and so I didn't train it much throughout the week, kind of saved it for competition. It wasn't perfect, but at least I got it off, competed it. Um, but yeah, and then I believe it was a month later, I then learned back three and a half off 10. Back three and a half, I want to say, is one of the scariest dives to learn yeah, I did not. I didn't have much success when I first learnt it. We never do. Yeah, <laughs> flat, flat on my back. I think two out of the first three times, and then progressively got better. You know, but yeah, then that was me. After I'd learnt that, that was all six dives within about six months. So, and once yeah. you have that list, you kind of hold it for many years. Yeah, it can take you all over the world. Hundred percent. Traveling yeah. with a dive that you're nervous about is hard. <laughs> That's <laughs> can you talk? Can you give people an idea of what it's like when you've just learned a new dive? Mm. You're not that comfortable with it, and you got to travel and compete with it. Hundred percent. I think a good example of what it feels like is, say, for instance, you go on a holiday, right, with your family, and you've done something really bad, but you don't want to tell your parents. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that at the end of the week, you're going to have to tell your parents anyway, right? And there's going to be like a lot of fear involved, a lot of consequences. That build up whilst you're on your holiday, those first four or five days, 
it's scary. You're like, I don't want to tell anyone. I'm going to try and enjoy my time here, but I can't focus because I'm so nervous to tell my parents. And that's what doing a new dive for me felt like. It was, I just learned this dive. I know I have to compete it at the end of the week. <laughs> I'm so scared and nervous to train it even, um, but I know I'll still compete it. So you're away at a beautiful location in a different state or country, but you can't focus on those small things as much because you're f- nervous about this dive, these new dives. That's how I compare it. Oh, yeah. I've never heard it explained like that, but that really kind of hit, hit, yeah. like, hits home for me because it's how it feels. You mm. go to an incredible place in the world. Yeah. Like, you should be nothing but happy, but because yeah. you've got the pressure of a new dive or even just competition. Yeah. But like, yeah, you're yeah. happy, you're excited, but you're also aware mm. you have a job to do. Yeah. And it may not go well. Exactly. But you've got to have a crack. 100%. I think one of the biggest things I fell victim of was overthinking. Everyone does. Yeah. So Everyone it's like, does, man. you want to be a perfectionist to a degree, but that also led me to think too much of my dives and cause me to not relax enough and just let my body take control. I'd like, overthink I need to push this hard do this much spin this quick and then I'd just stuff the dive up it's a weird combination Mm. in training you want to be a perfectionist and then you come to comp you want to be super relaxed as if you really don't care yeah and it's (laughs) polar opposites but yeah it's a tough balance yeah that's why I like platform because I could just give it 100% of my effort you know jump as hard as I can spin as fast as I can and then really only have to judge where my timing is on the come out or springboard, the whole thing I had to like balance and maneuver. Patience. Patience. I just come back from the world championships doing yeah. synchro with Curtis. Yeah. And it's so challenging because not only do you have to be so patient on the board, and when I say that, you have to walk slow. You need to jump at the right time, wait to catch the board, which means it has to bounce two and a half times before you get it on the way down. Yeah. To then jump up, wait for it to bounce two and a half times again and catch it and then do the dive. Yeah. And you have to be patient. You've got to wait for the board and you've got to wait for your synchro partner. Yeah, exactly. It's like the pole opposite to platform. And now I love synchro, mm. but now I just focus on platform for the Olympics. I'm back up there and I feel somewhat relieved that I can just get up there, go as fast as I want, jump as quick as I want mm. and just send it. Yeah. And you've made it for the platform event before and you're a very the good platform Tokyo. diver. Yeah. So. I yeah, you, you'll you'll be good. You know I'll be cheering for you. And all the other boys competing, obviously, because they're my good friends as well. But I miss that part of just going fast. Yes, I agree. Getting off. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I miss that too. Yeah. I think if I could hop back in right now and not have the injuries that stop me from doing platform, I probably would still try to go. But because I can't do platform anymore, I'm happy to hang my career, my career up and... Yeah. When it comes to injuries, Mm. they're a time of adversity, time of challenge. Yeah. And when I saw you injured and couldn't get in the pool, you were doing like full marathons. Everything you could do, you were doing. And a lot of people, when they get injured, they just sit back and do nothing Mm. and just wait. Yeah, that's right. You're doing everything you could. Can you talk me through what that process was like for you, how you felt and why you pushed so hard when you were injured? Yeah, so the specific injury, we'll talk about the one that stopped me doing a platform. I had, in hindsight, broken both my wrists, right? I'd left two stress fractures in both my wrists. I'd dived on them for about a year and a half and it just progressed to a potentially um, bone-killing disease. And that's from the impact of 10 meter. Correct, yeah, just the repetitive impact. Um, bones felt like they were getting smashed every time I hit the water. It wasn't a pleasant feeling. Um, I remember seeing you get out, man, like, look like you're going to vomit. Yeah, it, it was, I th- the easiest way to describe it was it felt like someone hit my, the side of my wrist with a hammer every time I hit the water. Um, and then I'd like shake it off. <laughs> Coach would say, let's do one more and I'd walk back up, do it again. <laughs> it was painful. It, it was, it was very painful, but I, I remember I'd be up there and I just felt bad for you, man. I was like, yeah, but that's part of the sport, you know. Like, I just, at the time, I was like, no, nah, I need to push through. And eventually got them checked out. Turns out I had this disease building in my wrists. So I had to take six months off. It was called Kynebox disease. 
I believe your sister had that. My sister had yeah. had to get a bone removed and yeah. had this like exterior like whole thing on it. Yeah, they oh, yeah they said they would have had to fuse my wrist together, um, so I wouldn't have had much flexion or mobility. In my I believe Climbox is a degenerative bone disease. Yes, yeah. So I think they said seventy percent of my bone had already died. So, um, and this is caused from the impact of ten meter. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's like the loss of blood flow to the bone, um, and had that, so it wasn't like a normal stress fracture where I could just take six to eight weeks, let it rest, let it heal, hop back in. It was, you need to take six to nine months, depending on like, we'll regularly check it up. I had like, I think 12 MRIs that year, um, just to see the progress of how it was progressing. And I told myself, I want to come back, because I didn't die for the six months, I want to come back into the pool, more fit, more healthy, and kind of like stronger than before I left. Obviously, my wrists were the things I needed to rest. So everything else I just trained. As you said, I was doing like triathlons every day. I was doing like a run, a bike, a swim. I'd do like ankle weight, running up and down the stairs. Um, I'd be there for like the full three hour, three and a half hours because I wanted to prove that I still wanted to be there. I didn't want to rock up to the pool and just, you know, stretch a bit do some abs, do a little bit of rehab and then go home. Cause I, I live a fair bit away. So it wasn't worth driving all the way over just to stretch and then go home, you know? <laughs> so I, I made the most of my time and I came back once I was allowed to get back in the water. I then did my, the first day back, I wanted to like see how far I could push it. And so I only did one meter. Okay. Um, so nothing detrimental to the wrist, but I, did my full one meter list. So that was like front three and a half, back two and a half, inward two and a half, reverse two and a half. And diving's not like riding the bike. No. You haven't done it for a while, even a week or two, like yeah. you know about it. 100%. And I felt really good. I thought I was going to not know where I was because I hadn't dived in six months, but it was the opposite because I was in better shape than I was before I left. And so I think like when we take like a week off after big competitions, we come back a little bit unsure of where our bodies are because they've just decided to slow down from what they'd been training previously. So, yeah, I had done the opposite. I sped up from what I'd done. Yeah. Mentally, coming in mm. for months, not being able to dive, working outside the pool, how did you manage that frustration or how were you feeling and how did you manage it? Yes, I think prior to that, I didn't have much resilience. I think that whole experience gave me resilience of just being like telling myself I still wanted to be there and reminding myself what my goal was, which was to get to the Olympics. It may have to be that I moved to springboard to get there, but I still want to get to the Olympics. That was my goal. And got through those six months, eight months, however long it was, and each day just tell myself I'm doing this so that I can become a better diver once I'm back in. I'm doing this so I can become fitter once I'm back in the water. And it panned out really well in terms of my fitness level and my diving hadn't diminished. It was just a matter of building up new skills on a different board. Which for six months off is huge. Yeah. I I know if I took six months off when we went overseas for a few months, I come (laughs) back. But I came back terrible. Yeah. No, it was definitely hard. But I think to answer your question, I was just really determined to proved to one myself and to the coaches and everyone that I wanted to be there you know so by keeping that goal mm. front of mind mm. that just drags you through all all the rubbish 100% that you had to get through 100% and even if I wasn't getting like the best guidance I would just try and guide myself you know <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about <laughs> yes so um a lot of self Res- determination and resilience was built. Yeah. I've always found that through struggles, even at the time, you just, well, I know I can be frustrated and just wonder why that's happening. And in hindsight, like it builds something in you that is very useful later. Mm. I agree. Like I've yeah. made some mistakes in diving that I've looked at and just thought, how the hell did I make that mistake? Yeah. And why? Why would I, how did I land on my back flat yep. at an international event? Yeah. And then over time, you're like, Look, it taught me just to be more patient, 
be resilient, push through. Mm. So something in the time that can seem detrimental and yep. just sad can be useful later. Definitely. And that's a bitter pill to swallow, you know? Yeah. Much easier bitter. said than done. Like, <laughs> yeah. Months grueling is how it's done. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. You've had those difficult times as well. Yeah. You know? Times where you even look in the mirror and you're like, can I do this? Yeah. Can I get through this? Yeah. So you lived over an hour away from the pool and here in Sydney, traffic is a massive issue. So mm. sometimes <laughs> you might come to training a little bit late. Yeah, 100%. Um, so I live around 80 kilometers away from Olympic Park and most mornings it would take about an hour and 15 minutes. So they would be leaving my house at 4.45 to get to training by 6 a.m. And... Yeah, and you'd not- be going home late too, man. You'd be at the pool till 7, 8 p.m. if we were coaching. Yeah. Drive home for an hour. Yeah. Get home around quarter past 9, 9.30, sometimes 10, if I suck around talking to some athletes or to you even or anyone. And um, We do the KFC run. Or a KFC run, you know, <laughs> healthy athlete life. Um, but yeah, and then wouldn't get much sleep and then do it again the next day. Wake up pretty early go to training i reckon you went a few years on four or five hours sleep yeah 100 percent. that's something i never understood how you did man yeah like i get eight hours a night mm. and I, or seven and i really protect those hours yeah and when you're driving so much and you're so far away from the pool it's really difficult yeah how did that feel how did you manage that and then when you finished diving mm. how have you found it now yeah so i found that if I got six hours sleep, I was like buzzing. I was like, perfect. Um, four was bare minimum and I could sustain that. If I did four hours every night, I'd get to Friday. I'd be very tired. Um, not the smartest decision. And then Saturday, because it was mainly only gym, it was okay. But then if I wasn't doing anything Sunday, I'd sleep in for like 10 hours. So it was it was... Not the smartest decision. I definitely could have been going to bed, but with school, like having to fit in studies. It was and barely being... a choice. It was from circumstances, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, not every night I studied, so some <laughs> of it was choice. But yeah, I just built a habit of going to bed late, waking up early. And my body had found a rhythm and a, call it a system that had worked, allowed me to have enough energy to do all these things throughout the day. So you're doing your whole diving career on nearly five, six hours sleep. Four. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I'd gotten more sleep. But <laughs> what impact do you reckon that would have had? I think fatigue would have made a massive difference. Yeah. I think I probably wouldn't have got as injured as often and towards the, the end of my career. There's a lot of like proof behind yeah. sleep preventing injuries. 100%. Obviously fatigue. Like mm. even sharpness, yeah. Like being able to spot and come out of a dive, yeah, requires being fresh to see, react, yeah. Like when you're tired, mm. it really throws so much off. I know when I get a bad night's sleep, the whole diving can can feel off because you don't jump as fast, so you don't get in the right position, so you don't see the same things, so you don't kick when you need to, yeah. And the whole dive can just be thrown. Yeah, that's yeah, so true. And I think. Had I, I understood those factors back when I was diving. I think I just, there's a bit of a oppositional defiance. I just didn't want to go to bed early. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I just didn't want to go. I was like, nah, like I, I need some me time. I need some. Yeah. To and you do. Yeah. You do need some. 11, time. 12 o'clock at night. Probably not the best time to do it. <laughs> you know, like watch a movie or. Who knows? You know, text some friends. So maybe you actually you could have gotten an extra hour. Hundred percent, hundred percent. If I had averaged an extra hour night of sleep, I probably would have been less fatigued. But who knows? I could have been worse off in certain ways. However, I do think it would have increased my fatigue and maybe injury prevention levels. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I could have gotten more. <laughs> it's like that though. I know when I come home late at night, I want. Yeah, you know, I want to scroll TikTok or just mm. mentally relax. You, you kind of need that one down time. Yeah. But living so far away from the pool, mm. some days you came late. And yep. 
given traffic and a lot of things going on, and it became a bit of a, <laughs> a, a running theme. That is for sure. It was at uh, sometimes it was more co- it was uncommon if I was there early, right? It was oh, it's ten past or five past. He should be rocking up about now, <laughs> which is not a great thing. Um, I've worked on that now. I'm much better with my time you are. efficiency. Yep. And, but that's also, I'd say, due to my sleeping patterns, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd sleep in until the last minute and then I'd go, but then I'd get in traffic. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I did come late. Yeah. It was, because a, it was a theme. I remember ob- obviously being, hey, Mo, you're very upfront. You're like, mm. oh, I slept in or yeah. traffic. Yeah. There was one day you came. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> there was one day you came like a solid hour and a half late. Yeah, and it was with an excuse. So far, in the world of make believe, no <laughs> one believed it. Yeah, it's like where did you pull this excuse from? But it was true. It was true. Uh, what happened that morning? So, <laughs> at the time, I had only just left home about five minutes ago, and all of a sudden, I hit a golf bag <laughs> and it's like okay golf bag normally just run over it however at the time i had a car that was probably no more than 10 centimeters off the ground maybe 15 that's right good looking car but hamish loved this car <laughs> it used to break down all the time and he insisted it was going up in value <laughs> <laughs> yeah i loved it it so, was it was so fun this car mm. So low, caught the golf bag. How yeah. did you not see the golf bag on the road? So I just come over like a hill, like a crescent on a hill, and it was just as I saw the other side of the road. That's where the golf bag was sitting. So as I saw the road, that's where it was. Didn't have time to swerve, and so hit it square on. Went underneath the car. It had like a big plastic round bottom, so I couldn't pull it out. Tried to reverse, wasn't moving, and I'm like, shit, what do I do? I'm going to be late. (laughs) So I ended up calling Tomo, who was running morning trading that that morning. And I was like, look, Tomo, I've run over a golf bag. I'm going to be a bit late. And Tomo's like a no BS guy. Yeah, no. He He won't put up with anything. He'll see through any bullshit, I say. And um, he's like, oh, okay. I'll see when you get here. Just let me know when you're almost here. And I'm like, oh, shit. All right, this is not going to be good. And... Then dad came because I was only five minutes from home. He brought the jack. So we jacked, we had to jack the car up to get the golf bag out. I got photos of it. And I made sure I got photos of it because I had to show <laughs> Tomo and the coaches. And rocked up to training, as you said, like an hour late by the time I'd gotten everything out and sorted it out. Rocked up and I walk in and Tomo's like, oh, yeah, where's that golf bag? And I was like, oh, I'll show you. And he definitely didn't believe me. I no put, one believed it. When yeah. Tom had told us that Hamish was running late because he had a <laughs> golf bag, we were like, he should have just said traffic. <laughs> no one believes him. And then yeah. you came in with photos. And then I rocked up with these photos and I'm like, look, I genuinely r- went over a golf bag and it got stuck under the car. I can't do anything else but show you. And he, they were just like, oh. Tom was like, I thought you were joking. I, th- <laughs> I thought you were joking. <laughs> so, yeah, that that was um, one of the few times I had an excuse that was very left field, but it was real, right? <laughs> <laughs> that has lived a long legacy. Oh, yeah. Even to this day when I see Tom, he's like, I'm telling you, if Hamish didn't have a photo of that golf <laughs> bag, no one was believing him. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, I've... Uh... Definitely learnt to that... take photo evidence of stuff these days from that. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, someone did raise the point, like, could you put it under there? But I wish I could have put it under there. <laughs> Do you know how hard that would have been to physically push under? <laughs> um, did you keep the golf bag? I think we still have it in our garage, yeah. That, that needs to be yeah. plastered on a monument and yeah. put it up somewhere. I'll, I'll hang it up in my room somewhere. <laughs> we should get it here behind the podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great idea. So, yeah. When you moved into Tomo's group, mm. Tomo was really regimented. Great guy. Yep. Best guy. Mm. But he wouldn't let you get away with stuff. Exactly. Like, and it, I respected it, that about him. As a coach, mm. that's what you need. Yeah. So when you came late a few times and you'd moved into his squad, yeah. he said, "Is it? I believe you're late one more time. I'm not going to coach you. Yeah. It was, it was 
I respect Tom a, a lot for this. He pretty much told me once I moved to, you'd been training with him for a little bit, uh, for probably a year or so. It, COVID had just finished the first wave of it and I moved into his squad. He said, I want to take you into my squad. I said, that'd be awesome. And he was like, we're going to have to build respect for each other. And I was like, yep, I understand that. And he's like, Sam and I have a great relationship. You and I aren't there yet. So you're going to have to show me that respect and build me that respect. And I'll do the same to you. I was like, I love this. This is great. He's telling me exactly how it is. And as my habit for being late had still been with me at the time, I had progressively become late to some things. And it was just frequent enough for it to be a nuisance, right? I was, it was a pain in the ass. And so I was like, look, I need you to really be on time. If, if you can't do that, it shows you do not respect me at all. And I'm like, okay, all right. Cause the coaches do work like that. It's a respect yeah. basis. It's, and it's fair enough. You're going to follow these rules mm. out of not just that's what you need to do, but out of respect for us because we're here. It's our time as well. Exactly. And I was like, okay, shit, I can't, I can't like mess this up. Like, He's given me the opportunity to be in his squad. I like I need to put my best foot forward. And I was trying, but I just had these bad habits. And I was like, all right, no. I, from now on, I'm never going to be late. Next morning. Didn't the night before he sit you down and say... Yes. What? The night before? The night before, he sat me down and he's like, hey, mate, if you're late to training, even by like five minutes, um, I'm not going to want to coach you anymore. Like, I'm not going to let you train with me. And I was like, okay, all right, I understand. I understand that. And um, I, <laughs> so I was really nervous, feeling pretty shit, but really understood what he was trying to tell me. And the next morning, <laughs> I, I was taking, I believe it was my mum's car to training. Was that because yours had broken down again? No. Okay. I can't remember why. Um but I was taking my mum's car and halfway, as I was about 10 minutes from training, I would have been 15 minutes early, you know, <laughs> I'd like taken note of what I was doing better. Because right? the night before he, he said, if you're the late before, one more time, yeah, I'm not coaching. That's yet. it. And so anyway, 10 minutes away from training, the car broke down. <laughs> the, car, the, the engine just decided to stop and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> this can't be real. Like what is going on? So immediately I had to like veer off like once the car turned back on I had to veer off a three lane highway onto like some side street then it broke down again I'm like shit alright I called Tomo first person I called I'm like were you Tomo, nervous? yeah yeah I was so nervous I was like Tomo I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I just told him what had happened how I'm broken down I'm like I can run to training I'm probably in like a half an hour I'll run away I'll be there don't worry and just like really trying to show him I was going to be there and I want to be there. Um, and then he's like, he's he's understanding, as you said. And he was like, no, no, I understand. Like, that happens. It's just obviously unfortunate it happened the <laughs> night after we had the talk. And yeah, then I got the car sorted. And eventually by the time it was fixed and all that, training had finished. So I saw him that afternoon. But yeah, not, <laughs> yeah, trying to put my best foot forward. Didn't always pan out. In my the cars have been a tricky one. Like, mm. I remember you broke down. <laughs> I remember you broke down the two-hour parking bay at Sydney Olympic Park. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> my battery died. And the, and yeah. the, the Rangers aren't very forgiving. Mm. So you'd like gone to find a battery and left a sign there. I wrote a note saying, "Going to find a battery. Please don't book me. <laughs> I've already spoken to one of the Rangers. He has agreed to this." <laughs> and uh, a couple of hours later, I ended up getting a battery. Yeah. But yeah, not the best luck with cars, but um, love them to bits. Love cars. Cause you, you love your cars. That's why we've always gone to the F1s. Yeah. Together. That's been so fun. Yeah. Very grateful for that as well. Oh, uh, of, mm. of course. We've made so much content mm. over the years and whenever an opportunity comes up, you want to try and go with your team and, and document it. You've always loved cars. How, how was your experience at the Formula One? It was incredible. I It was something I'd always wanted to go to and I think before the opportunity for you to go had popped up, I'd expressed, like, I love Formula One. Like, I love these cars. They're so cool. So then when you did get the opportunity to bring me along, I was ecstatic, right? I was 
overjoyed. I think the first time I gave you like 24 hour notice. Yes. That yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so that's good. something that I'm very known for. Like yeah. Last minute. Hamish, are you, are you free for the F1, Stu? <laughs> Do you want to come to Melbourne with me this weekend? Yeah, all right. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, it was very sporadic, and that was like most weekends for us. But That's really how we did that big content trip around the world. That's right. Yeah. I was flying out for the Commonwealth Games. I think it was a week before I called you. I was like, hey, Mo, mm. I want to go around the world and make content. Yeah. Yeah, you, you Ramon, and I, we sat down for dinner. Yep. Like... I think the one night you were in Sydney before the Commonwealth Games started, right? Um, and we're like, all right, let's do this. We're going to we're gonna make something of it. And the next time we saw you was in Birmingham at the Commonwealth Games. We went and, went and watched that and then obviously had the trip for the next two months, two and a half months. Yeah, awesome. What was it like for you watching the content go from something that we'd just jump in and make film with a GoPro after training for 10 minutes to... Mm something that can allow us to travel around the world for months together. It's interesting because as big as it's grown, for me it hasn't felt like it's changed much Mm. in the sense that obviously the content of what you're filming or where we're going is different, but the way I approach it and the way you approach it, I believe, is still with the same love and respect. It's, It's not like it's bigger and better so you have to so you have to act bigger and better it's just the same person same content and that's why i still enjoy hanging out and filming that's yeah. something i've found as well like we'd be over in barcelona yeah hanging out making videos yeah and it just felt like cool yeah we're doing this no, nothing crazy right it's just it'd be if we didn't have a camera that's probably how to be that's why I like to explain it to people. Like, yeah. I just do what I'd normally do, but film it. Yeah. No, nah, it's perfect. It's it's really good. Like in Hawaii, we go rock jumping. We yeah. just document let's, it. Let's film it. Yeah, that that was an awesome trip. Uh, definitely once in a lifetime trip. Maybe I, not once in a lifetime, but... <laughs> we, should, yeah. we, should go, we should go back. There's a lot more content mm. we can shoot there. Climbing that mountain in Hawaii that people had died on. The Three Peaks Trail. That was actually challenging. It was hard. It was It was very hard. I remember Ramon suggested that to us, mate. Top, top, top suggestion, Ramon. He did yeah. making content up that mountain. The further you go yeah. up, you're like, <sighs> yeah. like couldn't no. couldn't breathe. It was so humid and hot. Hundred percent. I think one of the best things from that trip was the fact that because it was all last minute, we really only had like a skeleton outline of our trip. Mm. So it was like we're going to fly to this country. We don't know what we're going to do there. We don't really have accommodation booked there we're meant to be there tomorrow (laughs) so it was like we would for instance from what was it Mallorca to Portugal (laughs) we had we we had our tickets to fly out of Mallorca in Spain for the next day yeah we didn't have accommodation booked we didn't have flights um or something yeah there was a lot of times where we didn't have stuff booked it's like the way we did it because Mm. The way I booked it, yeah, by getting around the world tickets for us, yeah, that was good. And the around the world tickets would take us to some interesting places that we would have to navigate from from there. Yeah, so we'd book flights in between. So we had a flight in from yeah into Barcelona and one out from Portugal. Yeah, and, and they were like three weeks apart or something. And we got to figure out something in between. Yeah, it was really good. That's the way I create the content. We we tailor it, but we also like it to be free. Mm. Like us. Yeah. And it was such an incredible experience because we, we had this freedom of traveling around yeah. while making high quality videos that were seen by hopefully millions. Yeah. It was it was awesome to be a part of that as well, you know, part of the team, filming, being in the content, you know, like it's quite fun, um, but even more so just hanging out with the mates, you know. It literally feels like that. Yeah. I think that's what keeps it really organic by like yeah. hanging around people you, you enjoy being around. Yeah. Helps that flow. 100%. Like from that trip, what, like hiking, surfing, scuba diving, quad bike ri- riding. That, you got one yeah. of the most viral videos I've ever made. Which one was that? The the video in Singapore. Oh, that was that was fun. That was cool. We yeah. tur- we'd turned up, right? Mm. And there was lightning and they got us out of the pool. Yep. And then you had the idea to be the first back in the pool. 
Yeah. Yeah. Get the shot. Because they had these lightning detection systems, and if it was further than like five kilometers away, you were allowed back in the pool, yeah. even though you would technically still see the lightning. And so we ended up waiting about 40 minutes, and we got the all clear to go back in, jumped in, and I was like, pass me your phone. You just do what you do, you know, hang around. <laughs> and um I'll, go do something in the pool yeah yeah I'll, I'll get the shot and so just line up the angles did what felt right and then fortunately just a lightning struck you know literally as as we were filming and there was no one else in there it was really cool those shots people have taken and shared across like mm. hundreds of travel pages yeah wow but like just from those one shots that you got yeah i feel like that attention to detail is so important because when we go out to do something and you just nail it mm. it's and both of us get it right that's what makes awesome yeah awesome content 100 percent. and i think i think we were speaking about this earlier a lot of it's because one perfectionism but two like if i had asked someone to film something for me i'd expect them to give a hundred percent right i know not everyone will but at least that's what i'd expect and so that's mm. what i try to give when someone asks me to do something for them yeah, yeah. that's something that it's like a pet peeve of mine. If I know someone's really good at something and when they help me, they put in no effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like when you see someone putting in a lot of effort yeah. for something, it's like, you know, they're looking out for you. No, a hundred percent. What about staying nice and calm? Mm. Hamo's vibe is always very chill. Even when we're under the pump at competition or we're like about to miss a flight <laughs> and I'm stressing. Yeah. You, you stress over those ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I say, cause I feel like I stress mm. because I feel like it's my job to make sure it's done. Yeah. And then Hamo's really relaxed. What's your mindset in those stressful moments? Yeah, good point. A good question. Um, Because I could probably learn something here, Ham. I'm definitely still stressed. I just know that me actively making myself more stressed isn't going to help fix the situation. So I'm like, that's the problem. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do to fix it? One, being anxious, being stressed isn't going to help me. It's just going to cloud my judgment. So I'm going to calm myself down so I can think clearly. Then from there, I know you generally get a feeling if something is going to end up right. Like Intuition. It, intuition, yeah. So it's like, oh, my flight's been changed three times already. Shit. Mm, that's stressful. <laughs> I need, I've got work in the morning. I need to be back in Sydney. Um, what do I do? What do I do? That's right. I'll get it figured out. It'll work out. You know, it's that positive reinforcement and still very stressed down here, but just not showing it up here. Mm. Um, you kind of fool yourself into thinking it's going to be fine. And it is. Well, the saying that the man who believes he can and the one that believes they can't yeah. are, are both right. Yeah. And when you're always staying so positive, I feel like you always stay open to the opportunities ahead. 100%. Yeah. Instead of closing yourself off. Yeah. I also think it's to do with like how quickly I can judge or interpret something. Say for instance, like um, a jump scare, right? Or like um, almost in like a car accident, something like that, where it's like quick reaction time. You got like the freezing, you've got like the people who like jump and get scared. I feel like, I process it, process what's happening quicker than my body allows me to react to it. Therefore, if it's like, say, for instance, you're trying to jump scare me, I can be like, oh, oh that's this hand trying to scare me. And then my body just c continues as it is. It doesn't like freak out. I, I can vouch for that for every time I've tried to catch Hamish off guard. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same with diving. I think that's why I was pretty meticulous with it was because even if I didn't have a good takeoff, I was able to correct myself midair because I was able to process it before, like fully process what I was going to do before my body even had a chance to do it and then yeah. do what I needed to do. Yeah. That fast processing of information, mm. it's interesting because I find in in the dive, I try to get the right takeoff and then just do the best with what I've got. Yeah, right. That's the goal. It's... But you are able to make changes in mm. the moment to try to fix it up. Definitely not the way you should be doing it, but... <laughs> I was able to do it if I did make a mistake, which which helped a lot because especially on springboard, I didn't have a consistent hurdle. So most of my dives were adjusting in the moment. So 
yeah, it was definitely a benefit, but I think it made me relax a bit too much and not focus on getting consistent with certain aspects I should have in diving. Achieving yeah. so many goals in out of the pool. Mm. What's your process for, I want to get here. Yep. How am I going to get there? What's goal setting like for you? Interesting. Yeah. So it was very clear when I was diving, like I would see an end goal and then I would try and map out, say for instance, it was at nationals. I want to come first, right? End of the year. It's a good goal. Yeah. Simple goal, <laughs> right? Uh, simple, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. So I would, nationals at the end of the year, I want to come first. That's nine months away. In those nine months, I need to have this dive by at least this date, this date, this date. So I'd map out what the end goal was, what it entailed. So how many dives I'd have to get, at least what scores I'd have to get. I'd break down where I currently was. And then look at the gap in between how much, like how much progression I had to make, whether that was add more flips, just increase my score with the dives I had, and then figure out a way with my coach, how do I increase my scores? Mm. All right. Oh, we're going to work on our jump speed so we can spin faster. Therefore, we have more time before the water to make it look smoother. Right. Or we're going to work on our twisting, keeping our legs together because we're dropping two points every time we twist because we our legs open, right? So understanding the big goal, then breaking it down into individual dives and what I can do in each one of those dives. Um, that was how I did it in diving. Outside of diving, a bit different. I've actually found it quite difficult to set like attainable goals since I've stopped diving, yeah. It's transitioning from an elite Australian diver, Mm. elite sport Yeah, outside has been difficult for nearly everyone. Yeah. What was that like for you? How were you feeling during that time? Yeah. It's... Were you happy with your career? Like how... Mm. What was that transition like? For sure. I think I look... I sit here now and look back on it. I'm happy, right? Had a very fulfilling sport career from doing gymnastics from when I was four all the way up until diving till I was 20, right? And I'm really happy of what I've achieved. At the time, it was very hard. Like when I stopped, I had to have a shoulder surgery and wasn't in the best physical condition to compete well. And so I stopped diving um, after the Olympic trials, which you... Went on to qualify a spot for the Olympics, which was really good. Yeah. And I went to surgery. Then from there, I was going to take like six months off to recover and then decide whether I wanted to come back or not. And I pretty much knew as soon as I had stopped, I wasn't going to come back. But that transition of going from training 10 times a week with someone making me be or being accountable to be there because I, you know, if I miss a training session, I'm in trouble, right? To then going to, I have to motivate myself to get to the gym, to, you know, wake up early, to study uh, whenever I have the time, you know. I had more time, but I found it harder to study in those times. Um, That was quite hard because I didn't have any accountability or guidance from someone else, which is what I had from four to 20 years old. Um, It was good in the sense that I was able to do what I wanted to do, but I wasn't happy in, uh, in small things I was happy, but like overall I wasn't happy because obviously wasn't as fit as I used to be. My time management wasn't as good. So it was a hard transition, but now I'm in a place where I'm quite, quite good, quite happy. So yeah. I hope that answers the question. It does, because I even yeah. feel if I have a week off training or a day off training and I think, oh, I'm going to get so much done. But without that structure, I mm-hmm. get way less done. Yeah. Like when I'm busy and I'm accountable and I need to be places and things need to be done, yeah, I get so much more done. But when there's less accountability mm. and you're not as busy, like, yeah. it's, it can be really difficult. Yeah. 
that's that's definitely the thing that's been the hardest to adjust to is the accountability or, or lack of accountability so yeah just finding something to go sh- either straight into or have something lined up for after athletes have finished sport that's super important it's going to keep them accountable to not do the same routine because obviously elite sports a lot <laughs> but a routine mm. of some sorts yeah because i'm always trying to build stuff outside diving to prepare for if i retire or if i get injured and, yeah. and can't dive anymore mm. like with my social media and yeah. trying to build up my businesses as much as i can and i got a small taste of that as did you during covid mm. and we couldn't train for it was like about six months yeah and sitting at home not being able to be accountable they gave us programs to do and i found it really difficult to do them like, oh yeah really difficult they're yeah. doing these zoom, zoom calls and i struggled to show up on them yeah i agree it's just really hard yeah and tom would make jokes about my internet being bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i said tom i just can't i can't get on the, yeah. the internet's terrible <laughs> you're like, nah, someone, no, you just don't want to do them. Yeah. So don't worry, I don't want to do them either. <laughs> but we got to do our best. But you have to. Yeah. yeah. And when we had more time, without that accountability of training, it can be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So other than that and building a routine, well, sorry, building a routine I think is super important for anyone who finishes elite sport or finishes anything and is moving into something different what'd that look like for you how did you mm. build a routine outside of diving which helped you have enough structure to achieve what you want to achieve for sure so it was a little difficult at first i'm not gonna lie because i was doing uni and i was also working in a pharmacy and i was coaching like diving coaching um and because all of that would change around on a three monthly basis you know or four monthly basis my uni timetable would be different therefore my pharmacy shifts would have to fit around my uni timetable and then coaching was always the same but it was always in the evening that was hard to find a good structured routine that was the same every day now what I've done is I've ended up finishing coaching at the end of last year and I now go to the gym every morning before work and I make sure that with uni, I'm getting everything I need to done as soon as possible. Um, and even though that's not necessarily structured, I find that if I get it as done as early as I can, I'm not stressing to leave it last minute, which then changes my normal structure because I have to move other stuff around. Yeah. Well, structure can mean different things for everyone. Like exactly. It doesn't have to be time accountability. Mm. It could be task accountability. Yeah, very true. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I do now that when I thought about me doing it younger, I thought there's no way I'd do that. But mm-hmm. I just do it differently. Yeah. Do it my way. And then that kind of works for me. And, you know, the coaches that have given me a hard time in the past about Sam's way in the, in, <laughs> yeah. in the gym. I'm, I'm and, pretty sure I've given you a hard you know, time. Th- <laughs> everyone's <laughs> given me a hard time about doing it Sam's way. Yeah. But f- for me, if I understand that I can back it, and if I can back it, I can... Mm prolong whatever it takes to get it done fair enough and oh like with the gym coaches yeah that, that one's an interesting one i've, I've got my yeah. own views on that but <laughs> <laughs> just uh, yeah. i just like to train with precision and speed yeah i like to not muck around i like to get in get it done and move quickly and, and it's worked so far so it works for me yeah um uh, but it's not perfect like and it's I, not for everyone yeah. It's not for everyone. Harish, what, what's been your 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 downside of seeing Sam's side of chipping away quite quickly? I would say... In, in the gym, Hamish gave me a hard time. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> The downside of Sam's style, I would think, would be technique, you know? I'll give him that. Yeah. It's all... <laughs> don't get me wrong. Efficiency was there. It was quick. <laughs> <laughs> it was quick. Um... And the effort was there, but it, the technique wouldn't always be perfect. And isn't a problem, but when we're moving, starting to move very heavy weights, mm. it could then turn into a problem. And that's when I'd get concerned. Because I never worried about what you were doing or how good or bad your technique was. But it was when it could 
detriment other stuff. That's when I was like, Ooh. and we had coaches mm. to keep an eye on it, but yeah, I've always found doing things your own way. Sometimes you can easily find a way through a challenge if yeah. you really back what you're doing. Yeah. And I think now you've done it long enough that one, your body's used to it. So it's not like it's a weird shock to the system. And two, you can do it in a safe manner. You you understand what to push and <laughs> what not to push. And so... We're not talking yeah. quick by putting on 300 kilos <laughs> to a squat <laughs> with a bar. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. So moving out mm. was was difficult, building on, I suppose, going to a completely different life. And now you're in pharmacy. Yeah. So I work in a pharmacy. One of our very good friends, um, I work with them. And I've been working probably five years in pharmacy now, since I finished high school. And I love it. It's good. I'm fin. I'm gonna finish the current de- double degree I'm doing, and then I'm gonna do a master's of pharmacy. That's exercise science and business. Business, yeah, correct. So it's a double degree, and the science, exercise science, um, will hopefully carry over enough credit points to do a master's of pharmacy. I'll just probably need to do one or two things before I can start it, and then, yeah, two years of that. Hey, he's just lined up to be the most educated out of all the boys. <laughs> I'm rooting for him. Uh, won't feel it, but <laughs> <laughs> on paper it might be. That. Uh, no, he, does. He, he, yeah. he does. Sometimes I mess up a word and Harry's just like, it's this one. I'm like, he's probably right. Yeah, Respectfully. <laughs> but <laughs> Now, yeah. when it comes to diving, I've made my fair share of mistakes. Oh, yeah. And they hurt. Mm. What's well, been the most painful diving splat? you've ever done and i've got a few in mind yeah there's a couple there's definitely not a small few um the most memorable one is when i first learned back arm stand one and a half twist double somersault off 10 meter my build-ups were great i was good at handstands i was good at twisting this was your dive it was eventually fun. eventually not this one <laughs> eventually <laughs> and the first one i did I got told to go up and I'm like, yeah, I was so confident. Like, I've got this. Normally I'm wary and nervous and a little bit scared for a new dive off 10. And can I say, this dive, mm. when you learn it, it's a real hit and miss. Yeah. Like I've seen, before I learned this dive, I saw two people learn it and both of them just wiped out. Yeah. Like flat on their side, destroyed. Yeah. And I just assumed it was part of the process. So when I learned it, I was t- I was petrified. Yeah. So when you're going up to ten, you're really confident. I was I was Why? overconfident because my build ups were perfect. Yeah. Like at least for a new dive, they were as good as I think they were gonna get. And I'll, and they told me to go up and I was like, Yep, let's do it. And I went up, did the dive, did the handstand, did the push, everything felt perfect, came out. Only problem was I, instead of coming out of the dive, the twist, and looking for the water, I came out of the dive and looked at my hands straight away, which were above my head. (laughs) And so I couldn't see the water. And so I ended up landing perfectly flat, like perfectly horizontal on the water. And my fingertips to my my tippy toes, they were just smacked. And it was... Probably one of the most painful things. My legs went black, my chest went red and black, and I had black eyes the next day. It was brutal. But then, never again did I stuff that dive up. The next one I did, I made try to look for the water, and I got it. So I was confident about the dive, I just was a bit too ambitious. And that dive went yeah. on to be one of your best. Probably my most consistent dive, yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, what, what's one of the moments you remember of me? Well, no, I just, I was, well, I was gonna just think about the handstand while we're like, when you did your press. Wait, which one? When you, when you did your press and when your balls come out. Oh, <laughs> that's right. One of the, one of the divers from I think it was Adelaide. Because yeah, when I do a handstand, <laughs> I do a pike press just to be safe. Yeah. But at the time, you were, you were doing straddle, which is where you split your legs all the way up. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, one of my one of my nuts fell out. <laughs> when you were in competition, <laughs> it was. <laughs> what happened? You you in Adelaide competing? Was it? We're in Adelaide competing, and I was doing as you said a straddle press, which is where my feet come apart to press to handstand. And one of the boys on the sideline, one of our mates, was taking photos. <laughs> Whether he was taking it out of like courtesy because he wanted to get some cool photos or because he was specifically looking for a bad moment, who knows? But anyway, he got this shot of me with one of my testicles <laughs> popping out of the side of my swimmers. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, this is terrible. Um, so yeah, not a very good moment. I'm pretty sure he showed a fair few people at the pool that day. Uh, and then after that, I always did a tuck up. I never straddled again. <laughs> Never ever. I always changed his diving technique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I even tried the cartwheel ones. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> oh, it's your worst nightmare. Like, you always do your drawstring up really yeah. tight because you hit the water so fast. Mm. You don't want your pants coming down. <laughs> it's happened to me before. Like, yeah. you're doing really tight. Yeah. But having the nut fall out in the press is really. How do you avoid it? You can't. <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> Just don't do a straddle press. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, or get some bigger swimmers. <laughs> that's that's the other alternative. Because in diving, you like your speedos being really tight because yeah. when they're tight, you feel like your body's sharp. Like mm. when you're in the air, you need to be tight. So if your swimmers are tight, it just plays into the whole thing. Well, hundred percent, very streamlined, very yeah, slim, and less likely than falling off. But that is also a massive more likely factor. of a ball coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. One of your most on the topic of your most painful splat for sure. Man, yeah. On the ball subject, <laughs> there was a time when I think you think you lost your balls. Oh, I know exactly which one you're talking about. This splat. When I witnessed this splat, mm. I thought <laughs> that's got to be the most pain a man can feel. Yeah. I genuinely thought for a second I wouldn't be able to have kids after this. <laughs> um, it was... Tell us in detail. Here. My birthday. And <laughs> at the time, whoever's great idea it was, decided... Everyone was doing birthday dives when it was their birthday. So that was that involved doing a new dive. Whether that's a big new dive you'd compete or just some massively hard skill that you'd do. And so I would I got told to do back triple, which I'd already done off seven meter, but got told to do it on five meter. And I'm like, oh shit, this is gonna be pretty hard. Stood on the end, biggest jump, went for it, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. <laughs> Kept squeezing, but realized I just hit the water <laughs> and I was in a full tuck. My legs were split wide open and my crotch area just like cupped the water like, like really, really hard. It was like the perfect <laughs> cup noise I'd ever heard. It was just like a... Yeah, <laughs> it was painful. And I remember hitting the water and just like, like coughing, like winded noises, crawled out. Just Normally I can like suck up the pain and just move on. That I could not. I was on the floor in a fetal position. And, uh, I was on the side. I just walked like, are you okay? Like, are you okay? Yeah. Nah. And not then... okay. <laughs> <laughs> not okay. Yeah. Nah. It was, that, that's definitely up there with the most painful. Yeah. And then he went over the Howell? Actually, he came over to me. I was still on the, f- on the floor here. And um, he was like, oh, oh, get up. It's okay. We'll go again. And I'm like, Oh, I don't I think, think I can. <laughs> I was crying or some some yeah, shit. Like, <laughs> you were like so strong, man, and you had like a tear coming out of your eye. <laughs> like, no, I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was painful. Because when you wipe out, mm. I know this feeling too well. You come to the side of the pool to make sure you're not going to drown. Yeah. And then you um you either just on your hands and knees, mm. or you're just on the ground. And you can't move. Yeah. You're in so much pain. You're trying to breathe. You're trying to compose yourself. You're trying to just get through this moment of shock. Yeah. it's And that's it. That's what it is. Shock. And then it's either the pain comes or you move on. Right? It's like, especially in competition. Oh. Both you and I have experienced in competition I, splats. Unfortunately. Yeah. Not fun. I have failed the dive <laughs> in competition. I remember I think I got six points on a back three and a half once. <laughs> Not many points. You would have beaten me in that comp. <laughs> Six points is a whole lot better than zero. Yeah, that's true. That is true. It's a terrible feeling in comp because you got the physical pain. 
Then you got the emotional stress and damage. Yeah. Which nearly hurts more. Yeah, the embarrassment. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a whole factor. The question of how could I have done a dive this bad in a competition? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And generally, you know exactly how you did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you're just like shocked as to how you did yeah, it. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I know what happened. I don't know why I did it. Yeah. But when you're in the air, mm. sometimes a terrible idea feels like a great one. Yeah. Like, I know I've taken off really slow. Mm. I'm spinning really slow. And for some reason, my brain's like, come out early. So yeah. You come out <laughs> and just smack. And you're like, why did I do that? Yeah. Nah, it's a uh, crazy sport. Lovely sport, but crazy sport. Oh. Yeah. I feel like once I've wiped down 10 minutes as well... Mm. I know what the feeling's like. <laughs> and that stays with you. That stays with you, eh? It does. And it's um it's it's like those those uh freestyle jumpers who just throw and send stuff off. I I, I purely believe it's because they haven't had a bad splat before. <laughs> the fact they can just send that, I think it's because they haven't had a bad splat. Because once you've had one it's like a um it's like a warning system. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your body knows not what to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and those kind of stick with you. But it's part of the challenge. Like, being able to get up, and that's something that I really respect about all divers. Mm. That, well, all divers that get up. The resilience. <laughs> yeah. Like, when you get hit hard, mm. I, I think it might have been Mike Tyson. He said, everyone's got a plan to get hit in the face. Mm. And the dive makes sense until you wipe out. Yeah. And you make a major mistake. Yeah. And being able to come back from that mentally to train, build up, have another crack, or if you're in confidence, a warm up, to just go up and have another crack straight mm-hmm. after. Like, I've got so much respect for people that do that. Yes. Yeah. You get put down hard. 100%. And you get back up. Yeah. Some of my best dives have been straight after a massive stuff up in comp. You know, land on my stomach, next dive, go up, do it. To like eight and a half nines and painful but you push through and if you don't that's when you kind of like we don't have a choice <laughs> exactly <laughs> like, exactly yeah you can go up and flail another dive or you can <laughs> or you can just go for it go up know? and have a crack yeah i remember i was in spain once oh i remember this, this was yeah. my worst wipeout ever man i was in spain and training had been great really yeah. good i was peaking yeah and i go up to 10 meter Reverse three and a half. One of the dives that I put down training for like nines, yeah. at least on entry standard. And I just made a mistake. It's like a split second mm-hmm. of concentration lost. I just wasn't thinking I come out the wrong time. and just landed flat up my back. Yeah. Like flat. I just got like full winded. Yeah. And I was swimming to the side in, in shock. I couldn't really breathe too well. And I went over the Tomo and he didn't even know, he didn't even really know what to say. And I'm like, yeah. What do you do? And I remember I sat down in the chair. That the medics just come to check. I was okay. They're like, oh, do you want to pull out? I'm like, no. Nah. No. Yeah. No. Nah. Keep going. You, you have, have to. to. Like, yeah. You have to. 100%. Um, and I remember my next dive was a back three and a half. And back and reverse are like the exact same dive. Very similar. Exactly. And I was yeah. like so nervous. I was like, I don't know what happened. Hopefully it's good. But like just sticking to the routine, having a crack, getting it done. Mm-hmm. Like you have to. But that builds like resilience. And respect uh, amongst the diving community. Yeah, agreed. And I noticed a lot of the greatest divers that I know have all wiped out on a dive that they can put down for tens. Yeah, and it's not like you have to. It's just generally they have. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like it's not. It's not <laughs> it's mandatory. Not, I'm not being a champion. You have to land on your back at <laughs> least once. <laughs> but it happens. It does. Yeah. Even at the recent World Championships, I saw a diver struggling in training, just landing on their stomach because they were mm. struggling to spot. Yeah. Then they go to comp and just drill it. Yeah, that's scary. Not spotting. I don't understand. It's yeah. Yeah. Like it's impressive. Hat, hats off to the people who don't spot where they are but can still dive very consistently. For everyone that like, doesn't... Hats off. That's impressive. For anyone that doesn't understand spotting, mm. when you're a diver and you're spinning around the air, ideally you have a visual reference of where you're going and what you're doing. So for me, I yeah. see the water yeah. on most of my dives. Was that the same with you? Very similar. So I would, on back, I would see... Oh, in reverse, actually. I'd see the water. Yeah. Yeah, so 
each summer was a good spot for back. Yeah, it's like directly under you. Some people spot the platform. I don't get it. No, couldn't, couldn't do that. So, and that's the thing, as you said, like you progressively move further away from it, whereas the water's always underneath. Yeah, yeah. So each somersault, you see the water, and that kind of gives you a reference as to where you are in the air. And then just before, or just as you finish your final rotation, and you got half left to go, you'll see your spot. Then that's your indication as to when to come out for the entry, and. I did it on back and reverse, front and inward. As long as I my head position was in the right mm. space, like not down on my chest, not looking up at the ceiling. As long as it was straight ahead, I didn't actually have to visually see where I was. Yeah, they were open, but I didn't have to concentrate on where they were. Front, front and inward. I like that. Like yeah. on the inward three and a half, I stand really tall. Mm. I just think. Like, quick jump, look at the platform, and then yeah. you hold the correct position. Yeah, that's it. And then you count. One, two, three, look for the water. Yep. Yeah, you feel it, and it's like the inertia. It's like each rotation, you can feel kind of like where that beginning spot was. It's, like, it's yeah. as if back in reverse, though, you need to see. The people that mm. don't spot, some do it really well, Yeah, but it can prevent major wipeouts. 100%. 100%. doesn't guarantee it. But <laughs> clearly, yes, <laughs> I can vouch for that. But yeah, no, definitely hats off to the people who don't end up like use using spotting techniques. I think I'm very grateful our coach did teach yeah. us that when we were younger, because otherwise, I would have been a very frightened kid. Yeah. When you when you have had one of those major wipeouts mm. and you've got to build back up, yeah, what's that mental process like for you? Say when you learn back three and a half and you're on your stomach. Yeah. And you know you need this dive. Yeah. Like, you can't just say, stuff it. I'm not doing it. Yeah. You need it. Yeah. Well, for that dive specifically, the first one I did, I landed really short, so I landed on my back. I then wanted to go straight back up, but my coach suggested um, that we just do some build-ups. So go back down to five meter, get the takeoff speed again, get the rotation speed again, because that's where I was lacking, the takeoff speed, right? So he said, let's go to five, build it back up. So then the next week, I had done a full week of just building the speed back up, went back on 10, week later, same thing, landed on my back. And I'm like, <laughs> shit, like I can't. It takes a toll. It takes a toll. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing the same thing I did a week ago just because I've landed the same way. So I went straight back up. Next one, I landed directly on my head. It was really good. I remember I remember all yeah. the on pool there, actually. Yeah, and, and I think it's just, that mental fortitude, you don't want to go in there knowing that if it's not good, like, oh, sorry, you don't want to go in knowing if you stuff up, then you're going to have to do it again. You want to go in there obviously trying to do your best, but not with the expectation of if it's bad, I'm going to give up, right? You've always got to be open to, it might not be perfect, but I'm still going to push if it's good or bad. That's really yeah. challenged me to grow as a person. Yeah. Because it's... Not something you can, yeah, you can just say, stuff it. I'm not doing it. Because mm. in diving, you need all six dives. Yeah. All six are challenging in different ways. And you can't compete without one of them. That's it. So when you're struggling with multiple dives, the only way forward is to figure it out. Which exactly. can be really scary. And and as you said, like it's, I think it's great that, especially in the men's event, you have to compete all six. It means... You don't have a choice yeah. of oh, I'm and your not. weaknesses. Yeah, you better figure them out. You don't have you don't get the chance to have one massive weakness, and therefore you don't have to compete it. You know, like I think it's very good. It keeps the competition very fierce, very competitive, and it keeps the best people at the top. You know, and yeah, that's that's why I love diving. The competitiveness of it. What was your mental strategy to get over that time when it was difficult? You've made two major mistakes two weeks in a row. Yeah. Uh, how did you process that men mentally? This is, yeah, this was quite difficult. I was very scared, like very scared of like, because it's painful, right? Leaning from 10 meters. I didn't want to feel that again. <laughs> and so at the time, the third one I did, which was a good one, I just told myself, like, like effort, I'm just going to give it everything I got, which is what I thought I did on the first two, but I realized I was being a little bit hesitant. So I was like, no, nah, I don't care if it goes over. 
because it's better than the last two I've just done, which are on my back. So that one was good. But in the going forward, having to do it like the next week, I was nervous that I was going to land on my back for the first one again. So the strategy I used was really breaking down and trying to separate my training from everything else I was doing. So it was like I'd be at school stressing my head off because I knew I had to do that dive in the afternoon. But then, Dude, feel, I yeah. remember the times at school yeah. where I was Stressful just days. sitting in class, <laughs> like sweating, because I knew I had to do a terrifying dive that night. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'd just wake up and think, oh, I've got to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> i got to rest. Like, mm. And and that's that's what my strategy was. It was when I'm at school, separate it. Do my best to separate it. You're obviously still going to think about it a bit, but do your best to separate it. And then... Also, don't think about what I've got to learn next week. Think about what I'm doing today. Sorry, one sec. <coughs> but, pardon me. Um, think about what I've got to do today. And tomorrow, yeah, I probably have that really hard dive. But I'm not doing it today. So just focus on day. Like when I was in that really tough situation of I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. I was just taking it single day by single day. Not thinking about what I was doing until the next one. Yeah. It's like that tunnel vision, separate, focus on task at hand. Yeah. It's typically how I try to deal with most things as well. Yeah. It's got to be the only way to effectively move through something challenging. 100%. Because I found I was getting overwhelmed in, especially when we first started diving, or when I first started diving, I just learned to say like back two and a half tuck. And I was like, this is scary, right? And I'm like, I've eventually got to learn (laughs) two and a half pike and then three and a half tuck and then from four and a half. And I just like overwhelmed myself. And that's when I tried to do the day by day thing and it helped. Yeah. Something that's probably not spoken about very much as, Mm. as a diver, but it does affect your whole life and learning new dives can be very stressful. And Mm. the thing that's beautiful about diving is you're always being challenged at every level. Because at one time you found the back dive really scary and hard. Yeah. Then the back one and a half. Mm. And then the back two and a half. Yeah. And then the back three and a half. So it's always pushing you to your limits. And when you get to the top that you're competing, so back three and a half, it's then learning to really bring down the effort that that takes mentally to do. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to make it go from like a 10 out of 10 scary and stressful to a three, a four, Mm. a one, ideally. Yeah. (laughs) With a zero, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that yeah, hundred percent. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, Hamish. Hey, whenever we travelled together, we'd always typically room together. Yeah, it was so much fun. Uh, but I'd always sleep with the aircon on and and the fan. I have to, and you always got sick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let me tell you. Every single time, every single time I stayed in his room, whether it was at his house or at a trip we went on for diving. I would catch a cold without fail, without fail. Cause I wouldn't sleep with a fan on, but this man slept with like a fan on the air conditioning on everything that would blow some sort of breeze on his face. He would sleep with it on and it would give me a cold. So I eventually started making him remove it or turn it off or I'd just sleep in a different room. <laughs> I remember one time we were over in Tasmania. Oh God. Like snowing outside. Yeah. And I'd have the aircon on inside. Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> like, we were trying to sleep and you had like 10 blankets. Yes. Oh. You're like, try and stay warm. No. Did you get a cold in Tassie? 100%. Did you? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, well, also in Tassie, what happened? That was um, the place I got that nosebleed and stuff. That's right. <laughs> we were in the competition. Mm. No, we're in the warm up for Australian Junior Nationals. Yeah. Trials for the world. Junior championships. Yeah, that's right. And you went blind during the warm-up. It was weird. What happened? Yeah, it was weird. I don't actually know why it (laughs) happened, and it had never happened prior. It was about five minutes before the warm-up. I just started losing vision in one of my eyes. Not both, fortunately, but just one of them. Like, my right eye just decided to, like, go cloudy, more cloudy, and then eventually, like, black, and I'm like, I can't see out of my eye. And then the warm-up starts, I do one dive, and then my nose starts to bleed. Hopefully they weren't related, because that would be pretty bad. (laughs) Um, And I was like, I can't afford to miss this warm-up. So 
I kind of like just kind of block my nose in between dives, just went. And then eventually by the start of the competition, 10 minutes later, my nose has stopped bleeding, right? I sorted it out. Your vision, what was happening? But my vision was blind. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you dive, being able to see is crucial, to say the least. 100%. So when you went blind in one eye, what, yeah. what, like was it black? What was? It was completely black. Like I'd have both eyes <laughs> open like this and it just felt like I was looking like this. Like Is I, that not just scary as well? It was scary. And fortunately, back then, we were in juniors. So we had four or five dives at the start of our comp that were basic, right? Or at least more simple than the ones we did later in the rounds. And so I was praying by the time I got to my hard dives <laughs> that my eyes would fix themselves. And I think I went the first three rounds. Good um, <laughs> I could only use one eye. And it was kind of like when you're trying to like catch a ball with one eye closed it's not going to be easy or perfect it kind of felt like that and yeah i i ended up doing the dives pretty good like you actually had that was another comp we went dive for dive yeah and we both qualified for the junior worlds yeah i'm on I, my second dive was a back dive and i believe i got like nine and a halves and like one or two tens it was incredible dive. yeah and, it was just in the and i couldn't see in the warm-up yeah. you were like bleeding nose disappeared then you're like sam i can't see yeah like, what do you mean yeah my eyes going black. Yeah, but fortunately, by round four, it has like completely come back. So I was like, "All right, now I can not stress and just compete how I would want to." So and you and you did, and I did, and, and it qualified me for the junior world championships. So what's next for Hamish? You finished your diving career. Mm. You've transitioned out of sport successfully, which is really hard for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. What are you working on now? I'm just working on myself, actually. So I'm getting back into a shape, a, well, a stronger, and a different shape to what I was when I was diving. I was very fit when I was an athlete. I want to get back to something like that, and I've been working on that for a couple of months um, and just going to keep progressively working on it. I've also got my uni to finish off. That's something I'm going to focus on for the next couple of years. And once I finish that, I'll be fully fledged pharmacist. Hopefully, um, he's going to be Doctor Ham. Yeah, and I'm close to it. I'm going to start playing soccer this year with my brother. It's a bit of fun. Never got a chance to play. Any when I'm finished diving, I want to join a yeah. recreational soccer team. Yeah, so I'm pretty keen to play that. I haven't played since I was like I don't know five or six. So that'll be fun. And other than that, just. Working hard. Chipping away. Chipping away. Enjoying yeah. time with my mates, you know? I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been a very fun episode. Because Hamish is such a close mate. Mm. Uh, we can laugh about a lot of things that... Mistakes that I've made or... Yeah. <laughs> or di- di- diving challenges. It's It's been a fun episode. But it's it's all through tough times. And mm. I think through those the, those years diving together, building a lot of respect yeah. for you and seeing you push through so much adversity... Is yeah. part of the reason I wanted you to come on today because seeing how happy you are with your your diving career moving forward it didn't come easily. Yeah, no, thank you, dude. I appreciate you having me on and uh, getting the chance to talk about this again with you. You know, we gloss over it every now and then. Yeah, we do. <laughs> but to have a deep conversation about it, it's it's nice. It's refreshing. So thank so, you for having thanks me. Thanks, come on, brother. Cheers, man.